I wanted to read this article from the American Conservative that was written by Douglas McGregor titled After Bakhmut with the subtitle Russia turned Bakhmut into the graveyard of the Ukrainian military power. What comes next? Now, I'm going to be brutally honest with you guys. I don't like Douglas McGregor. Not only because, you know, he I just fundamentally disagree with him about the ethics of the war and the morality behind this war, but I don't like Douglas McGregor because he's a dumb fucking clown. He's a dumb doo-doo brain who doesn't know what he's talking about, and I don't care if he's a general, he constantly says things that are just verifiably false. And all of the predictions he's made during this war have come to be complete, have come, uh, bleh, have turned out to be nonsensical and have turned out to be 100% wrong. So we're going to read a little bit about this article. I also just disagree with the fundamentals of what he's putting forward in this article about how Bakhmut is, was the deciding battle of the war and the Ukrainian military is, is, is shambles of its former self and it just won't recover. The only reason I'm talking about this because of how little respect I have for Douglas McGregor is because I did see this article getting quote tweeted and posted on social media by people who either A, are none the wiser about Douglas, Douglas McGregor and how uh, wrong he is and how tragically wrong he is time and time again, or B, it's people who don't care and are using him cynically. So we're going to read a little bit of the article. We're going to look at his bold predictions that he's making in this article and what he's saying about the Battle of Bakhmut. Then we're going to go look at his past predictions. And you, you sitting there at home, you looking on your phone, you listening through your headphones as you play games or, or do your work, uh, you're going to be able to come to a decision on whether this is somebody that should be listened to when it comes to this war, whether this is somebody who's putting forward a reputable piece of advice, or if this is somebody whose word is worth less than the paper it was written on. So let's look at what he has to say about Bakhmut. Until the fighting began, national military strategy developed in peacetime shapes thinking about warfare and its objectives. Then the fighting creates a new logic of its own. Strategy is adjusted. Objectives change. The battle for Bakhmut illustrates this point very well. Keep in mind that line, objectives change, by the way. We'll come back to that. When General Sergei Vladimirovich Surovikin, General Surovikin, you can just say that, commander of the Russian Aerospace Forces, assumed command of the Russian military in the Ukrainian theater last year, President Vladimir Putin and his senior military advisors concluded that their original assumption about the war were wrong. Washington had proved incurably hostile, incurably hostile to Moscow's offers to negotiate, incurably hostile. It isn't, he's not going to describe the Russian invasion as incurably hostile, the thing that's actually killing people and destruction and, and devastation wreaked upon the country. No, it is the American government not accepting Russia's blatant annexation of large swaths of territory. That is what is hostile. Okay. And the ground force Moscow had committed to compel Kiev to negotiate had proved too small. By the way, listen to what he's saying here. The ground force Moscow had committed to compel Kiev to negotiate had proved too small. So what he is saying is that the military force that Russia deployed and marched on Kiev that was unable to take the capital was simply there to compel Kiev to negotiate. But it was too small. So there's there's a few reasons why this doesn't make any sense and why Douglas McGregor is full of shit here. Uh, the first reason is that the force that Moscow put outside the capital was actually extremely large. Not enough to take the capital, mind you. And you would think, oh, isn't that in favor of his point? But that was because the Russian government thought that the Ukrainian government would collapse merely at the thought of the Russian army marching on Kiev. And that's why... They didn't march on Kiev like would be traditionally speaking, as in, oh, we're going to try to surround it on all sides. Uh, we're going to, you know, do this as, uh, you know, do this by the book and plan it out. They basically just marched towards every major city all at once. They did it in Kharkiv and were beaten back. They did it in Kiev and were beaten back. They did it in Mariupol and were beaten back for months. Uh, they marched on every major city. Uh, created basically long lines that look like the gigantic lines uh, into a uh, Six Flags amusement park ride, and then they were ambushed and attacked from all sides. 
uh, the corridor, the, the line that the Russians formed outside of Kiev, ended up at one point being 40 miles long. You would not line up your troops in a 40 mile long line unless A, you had tremendously messed up in your logistics and planning, or B, you legitimately thought you could just walk into the capital. And so you just got all your troops together, marched on the capital, thinking it would completely collapse. In my opinion, I think it's both. Uh, another point in favor of them not just doing this to compel them to negotiate is the fact that the Russians did VDV landings. VDV landings, for example, at Hostomel Airport, which is right outside of the capital. The point of this landing, to get control of the airfield so that they can then get air superiority in the area, which the Russians announced that they had 24 hours after the invasion, even though they didn't have it. They announced it too early uh, because, once again, they were too eager in their announcements. And they attempted at that point, once they were not able to just walk into the city, to surround it. You can see as uh, Russian troops try to march at it from not only the north, but they also tried to march at it from Chernihiv, from the direction of Chernihiv. Just these long corridors, unsupported, unsustainable, under the idea that hopefully they could just make the capital surrender or maybe surround it on all sides and eventually take it because the might of the Russian military would kick in. This did not happen. If it was just to compel Kiev to negotiate, why did they do VDV landings? Why was there a 40 mile long line of Russian troop convoys that were getting ambushed and, and destroyed? And why did they run out of fuel so quickly that they had to abandon their vehicles if it wasn't because they thought they were going to win the war like that? Let's continue. Surovikin was given wide latitude to streamline command relationships and reorganize the theater. Most importantly, Surovikin was also given the freedom of action to implement a defensive strategy that maximized the use of standoff attack or strike systems while Russian ground forces expanded in size and striking power. The Mokbut, the Bakhmut meat grinder was the result. Uh, when it became clear that Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, by the way, if you want to know why the Bakhmut meat grinder came to be, it wasn't because the Russians wanted a Bakhmut meat grinder, like he said. The Bakhmut meat grinder was specifically trying to be avoided at every step of the way. Um, the Kharkiv counteroffensive, though, made it a lot more likely. Originally, the Russians could actually uh, were a lot deeper into the Kharkiv Oblast, and their odds of surrounding the city of Bakhmut, and possibly also surrounding the city of Kramatorsk, an even bigger city in the Kharkiv Oblast, uh, not in the Kharkiv Oblast, but in the Donetsk Oblast, that the Russians desperately want and is actually the bigger target for the Russians, not Bakhmut. In fact, the only actual strategic significance of Bakhmut at this point is it's just one further stepping stone on the path to Kramatorsk. Originally, the plan was to surround Kramatorsk and Bakhmut all in one fell swoop, you know, pulling pull a little Schlieffen plan, uh, until the Kharkiv counteroffensive took away the angle that they could have utilized in order to do this. Um, then the strategy became, well, we're going to surround Bakhmut itself. Remember how all those American officials were warning the Ukrainians to pull out of Bakhmut? Now people talk about it as if, oh, the American generals were worried about high casualties for the Ukrainians. That's one element of it. Uh, that wasn't the biggest motivator behind the Americans wanting them to pull out. Um, as we found out since then with the Jack's text terror leaks and a lot of inf other information that has been brought to the public attention, the Russians have taken very high casualties during the winter offensive, especially around Bakhmut, through what essentially has become human wave tactics. Since uh, they tried to circle the city uh, twice, first with Kramatorsk and the second time just by surrounding the city, and when that failed and they tried to do that for months, they basically resorted to just slamming their head against the wall to just throwing human wave tactic after human wave, uh, human wave after human wave at the city, taking building after building, block by block, street by street, with immense casualties. That is how the Bakhmut meat grinder came to be. Then you combine that with basically shelling the city to the ground, reducing it to dust, dust uh, bombarding it from every angle, as well as slamming Wagner soldiers many of them former prisoners that have been recruited from prisons, against these positions after hammering them with artillery, hammering them with rocket strikes, before then finally, after sending in your Wagner prisoners who will get torn up, 
you send in the Wagner commandos, the Wagner soldiers who have experience in Central Africa, who have experience in Libya, who have experience in Syria, to try to do the cleanup work. Now, this strategy, while it did eventually get the Russians Bakhmut, took them nearly 10 months, nearly double the length of the Battle of Stalingrad for them to capture Bakhmut. And trust me, it was very painful capturing Bakhmut. Very painful. Uh, just one strategy that I like to communicate quite often because it just shows you how bloody this battle was. Something the Ukrainians would do is that they would prepare positions on the front line with the Russians to be abandoned once pressure on those positions got too heavy. They would then jerry-rig it to explode, to you know blow up the whole building once they abandon it. The Russians then fill in the building, and then the Ukrainians detonate it from a distance. This became so commonplace that the Ukrainians would do this once they abandoned a building. Not only would it leave the the Russians' new positions just a, a pile of rubble, which would, of course, make what they were fighting for worthless, uh, outside of just, hey, I, I guess we've got, like, a few more meters of territory, but it would also usually take a bunch of Wagner boys or Russian soldiers with them, which would then also make Russian commanders more, you know, nervous when sending Russian soldiers in and more hesitant when sending Russian soldiers in to capture positions, but they have to capture the positions, so they ended up doing it anyway. And this led to an extremely bloody battle. I know the Jack, Jack Textera leaks uh, suggested that the Russians have taken 2.5 to 1 casualties in Ukraine, meaning that for every Ukrainian soldier that dies, 2.5 Russian soldiers have died. That information, though, that data is months old, even by the time it was leaked. So who knows what these latter months of the Battle of Bakhmut, which have been particularly bloody, have been like for the Russians. And that's also for the entirety of the front line, which is extremely massive, not concentrated for, for Bakhmut, where these human wave tactics have become most notorious. They've become notorious in other locations too, but they've become most notorious in locations where Wagner is heavily operating, like Bakhmut. It, I would be very surprised if the casualty number for the Russians in Bakhmut was not significantly higher, uh, higher in its level of disproportion between the 2.5 number that the Jextax Terra leaks showed across the entirety of the front line, since a lot of these, you know, more, I guess, these tactics that disregard the lives of a lot of the soldiers have been used in Bakhmut in order to capture the city, mostly for propaganda PR purposes, wanting to finally get a win after being pushed back in Kharkiv and pushed back in uh, Kherson. Let's continue a little bit more. Uh, I'm rambling a lot. Uh, I, I do like rambling, though, so I'm going to probably keep doing it. But I want to also get to Douglas McGregor's history at some point once we're reading this article, once we're done reading this article. Sir Ovikin was given wide latitude to... Oh, I already read this. When it became clear that Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, and his government regarded Bakhmut as a symbol of Ukrainian resistance... To Russian military power, Sirovikin turned Bakhmut into the graveyard of the Ukrainian military power. From the fall of 2022 onward, Sirovikin exploited Zelensky's obsession with Bakhmut to engage in a bloody tug of war for control of the city. As a result, thousands of Ukrainian soldiers died in Bakhmut and many more were wounded. Okay, so first off, I have no reason to believe that Zelensky regarded uh, uh, Bakhmut as so much a symbol that they would risk the entirety of the war over a city of 70,000 whose capacity to act as a logistical hub, which was the only other benefit outside of, you know, capturing another piece of land for the Russians that it could be that it could provide already being destroyed like six months ago because the city was reduced to ashes like six months ago. For the last six months, it's just been them continuously bombing the ashes until they took over what was left of the city. What's left of the city is, is almost nothing. So I don't know why Zelensky would make Bakhmut the symbol, but if this was true, that Bakhmut was the symbol of, of resistance to such a degree that, that Zelensky, over, I, I would assume in this scenario, would be overruling his generals overruling the experts, overruling American officials who are all going to be screaming, Bakhmut is not something we should bet the entire war on. And he's going to commit all of his resources as possible to keep, to keep it. And he was unable to, unable to, according to, uh, according to our friend here, Douglas McGregor. This does not make sense to me. 
This doesn't make sense to me for a few reasons, but I'll just say the most obvious reason. If it is true that Zelensky bet the entire war on Bakhmut, and this was not an extremely, in my mind, an extremely successful delaying operation, concentrating the entirety of Russia's winter offensive into a single city uh, when it comes to actual territorial gains, when it comes to stuff that they've actually captured. Over the last six to eight months, the Russians have captured tremendously small amounts of territory for unbelievably high losses, unbelievably high amount of use of resources, loss of vehicles, loss of equipment, etc. I don't know where Douglas McGregor is getting the data that the Ukrainian military leaves the Battle of Bakhmut in worse condition than the Russian military for who fought there in that area or just generally. He doesn't cite any data. I feel like this is purely just fueled by feelings and just his guesstimations. Um, but the last, the last thing I want to... I want to point out here is if, and this is my main point, I'm sorry, I've been kind of beating around it. If it is true that Zelensky bet the war on Bakhmut, then he would have committed the newly trained units, the newly trained units that have been left in reserve, trained by the West, many of them using, you know, using Western equipment, good Western equipment, leopard tanks that have been held in reserves continuously to be committed to a counteroffensive. If it is true that Zelensky bet the war on this, why didn't he commit those units to the battle? This would be like hearing that, oh, uh, Douglas, McGra uh, Douglas Mac MacArthur bet everything, everything on the Battle of Iwo Jima. Uh, but he also kept like 60 to 70 to 80 percent of his forces somewhere else. He also had 100,000 people on standby that he could have committed, but he didn't. It doesn't make any sense. If Zelensky bet the war on Bakhmut, he would have committed the forces that he had in reserves. The forces that he has in reserves and he's holding the newly trained units, which we heard, we heard are of a good quality. He would have committed them to Bakhmut. It doesn't make any sense. So Ravikin's performance is reminiscent of another Russian military officer, General Aletsky Anatov. As the first deputy chief of the Soviet general staff, Sorovikin was, in Western parlance, the director of strategic planning. When Stalin demanded a new summer offensive in a May 1943 meeting, Anatov, the son and grandson of the Imperial Russian Army officers, argued for a defensive strategy. Anatov insisted that Hitler, if allowed, would inevitably attack the Soviet defensive in Kursk and salient and waste German resources doing so. Stalin, like Hitler, believed that wars were won with offensive action, not defensive operations. Stalin was unmoved by Soviet losses. Anatov presented his arguments for the defensive strategy in a climate of fear, knowing that contradicting Stalin could cost him his life, to the surprise of Marshal Alexander uh, Zhukov, who was present at the meeting, Stalin relented and approved Anatov's operational concept. The rest, as historians say, is history. So, this is really, really fucking stupid. Not only do I not think this analogy works, but in this analogy, wouldn't the roles be in reverse? First off, the Russians are the ones on the attack, as Hitler would be in this scenario. Hitler attacking Kursk, the Russians attacking Bakhmut. The, in this scenario, it is the Russians going on the attack because they believe they need to go on the attack in order to win the war. And so they're attacking even though it's costing them much more resources, much more power, manpower than they're gaining. And the Ukrainians are the ones in the defensives waiting, preserving manpower, whittling down the Russians, whittling down, in this instance, the Russians, waiting for their chance to strike. While I don't think this analogy works at all, if it does work in any capacity, it's in the exact opposite. I honestly don't know what he was trying to get at with this analogy. It is hard to decipher, considering that if you were to make this analogy, if you were to compare it, again, it's the Ukrainians on a defensive, it's the Russians on the offensive. It's the Russians wasting their resources on this offensive. It's the Ukrainians holding in weight uh, on the defensive. They're the ones preparing for the big counteroffensive. They were the ones taking the risk to stay on the defensive instead of going on the offensive and prepare for future attack. It, this, this analogy makes no sense. Mr. Delight, thank you so much for the tier one and being sub for nine months. Yo, Dylan, I'm really excited for you, and I'm going to let you finish. 
but gutter chat is the best chat of all time of all time mr delight you're a liar a fibber and a uh and a uh rapscallion and they aren't even protecting their border yeah that's the other thing but that's that's totally separate i feel like i'll get in too much of a rabbit hole if i talk about that anyway uh i have no clue why douglas mcgregor is making this comparison so let's 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 finish this article before i talk about douglas mcgregor and why reading this was almost a waste of was almost like a waste of time for us considering how silly this guy is even though if you go and check out you know jackson hinkle stream jimmy Dore's stream if you go check out a lot of the alt media figures they they love bringing on douglas mcgregor oh they love bringing on douglas mcgregor to talk about how the ukrainians can't win okay let's continue if president putin and his senior military leaders wanted outside evidence uh, for Surovikin's strategic success in Bakhmut, a Western admission appears to provide provide it. Washington and our European allies seem to think that a frozen conflict in which fighting pauses but neither side is victorious, nor does either side agree that the war is officially over, could be the most politically palatable long-term response for NATO. In other words, Zelensky supporters no longer believe in the myth of Ukrainian victory. What? What is he talking about? Can we... See what the source is? Politico. Ukraine could join rank of frozen conflict, U.S. official says. Let's see. U.S. officials are planning for the growing possibility that the Russia-Ukraine war will turn into a frozen conflict that lasts many years, perhaps decades, and join the ranks of similarly lengthy face-offs in the Korean Peninsula, South Asia, and beyond. The, optics, the option discussed within the Biden administration for a long-term freeze include... Uh, where to set pro uh, potential lines that Ukraine and Russia would agree not to cross, but would not have to be official borders. The discussions, while uh, provincial, have taken place across various U.S. agencies and in the White House. And it's a scenario that may prove the most realistic uh, long-term outcome, given that neither Kiev nor Moscow appear inclined to ever admit defeat. It also is becoming increasingly likely amid the growing sense within the administration the upcoming Ukrainian counteroffensive won't deal a mortal blow to Russia. So what he's saying here is this: what, what is this admission? Wait, I'm sorry. I'm 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 sorry. Douglas McGregor is really hard to decipher. Washington and European allies seem to think that a frozen conflict uh, could be most politically palatable long-term outcome for NATO. That's not at all what was said. That's not at all what was said in that article by Politico. Fuck off. All that article said was that that is a possibility, which it is a possibility. That doesn't mean that's what the West wants or that's what would be best for the West. It doesn't even make any sense. How would it be more politically palatable, not strategically palatable where all we're forever, you know, grinding down the Russians, but politically palatable to not win? It's always going to be more politically palatable to win your wars. This doesn't even make any sense. Not only is that not said in the article, it, it doesn't even make any sense. The question on everyone's mind is, what's next? In Washington, conventional wisdom dictates that the Ukrainian forces launch a counteroffensive to retake southern Ukraine. Of course, conventional wisdom is frequently high on convention and low on wisdom. Douglas McGregor has a lot of wisdom. On the assumption that Ukraine's black earth will dry significantly to support ground maneuvers forces before mid-June. Ukrainian forces will strike Russian defenses on multiple axes and win back control of southern Ukraine in late May or June. Roughly 30,000 Ukrainian soldiers training in Great Britain, Germany, and other NATO member states are expected to return to Ukraine and provide the foundations for Ukrainian counterattack force. General Valisi Gerasimov, who now com commands the Russian forces in Ukraine, now knows what to expect. He is undoubtedly preparing for the Ukrainian offensive. The partial mobilization of Russian forces means the Russian ground forces are much larger than they might have been in the mid-1980s. It gives the capacity of ammunition available. Okay, you know what? I think this is all worthless. We don't need to read the last few paragraphs. I'm going to tell you exactly why we don't need to wait, read the last few paragraphs. Douglas McGregor's opinion on everything is absolutely worthless. And especially, especially his opinion on this conflict. I would trust a random Twitter user more to predict the outcome of this war than Douglas McGregor. He is so consistently wrong in making predictions that if he makes a prediction something is going to happen, you should bet 100% of the time on the exact opposite of what he predicted. 
I have a few of these examples pulled up for just this war of the times he made predictions that did not come true. And I don't have all of them. I just have a few of them that I could easily find just through Google search. So this also is not an extremely difficult thing to find. So if you are somebody who's hosting Douglas McGregor on your platform and you're not bringing this up to him, you're a schmuck and you're just working to polish his boots. So let's read a few of the predictions he's made in the past. This is from February of 2022 at the start of the invasion. The battle in Eastern Ukraine is really almost over. All of the Ukrainian forces there have been largely surrounded and cut off. You have a concentration down in the southeast of 30 to 40,000 of them, and if they don't surrender in the next 24 hours, I suspect Russia will ultimately annihilate them. Uh, so uh, even if we were to hyper-focus on the Battle of Mariupol for that stage, you know, the, the fighting in eastern Ukraine, that fight, that battle would go on for like three to four months after he posted this image, but not posted this image, posted these words, said these words. So that prediction was wrong. Here's another prediction from March 4th, 2022, less than 15, 20 days apart. <clears throat> the first five days, Russian forces, I think, frankly, were too gentle. They've now corrected that. So I would say another 10 days and this war should be completely over. He said that on March 4th of 2022. Another prediction, wrong. Prediction, wrong. Next one. The war is really over for the Ukrainians. They have been grounded to bits. There's no question about that, despite what we report on our mainstream media. So the real question for us at this stage is, if there is an agreement, Tucker, are we going to live with the Russian people and their government? Or are we going to continue this pursuit this of short-term regime change dressed up as the Ukrainian war? He said that on March 17th on Tucker Carlson's program. Of course, the war is still going on more than a year later with more than 50% of the territory that the Russians captured being recaptured. Very, very, very wrong. Let's keep going, though. There's more of these. There's more of these we should quote. This is from July 8th, 2022. The war, with the exception of Kharkiv and Odessa, as far as the Russians are concerned, is largely over. There is no intention to do anything else. Not only has the war been going on for almost a year since he's made this prediction, but the Russians have been unable to capture Odessa. In fact, they've never captured a single itch of territory on Odessa. And since he made this prediction, the Russians were pushed out of Kharkiv. Here's another quote from September of 2022. This war may be over soon. Right now, things are going very badly for the Ukrainians. Now, for those of you who were paying very close attention to when I said this was, this was in September of 2022, some of the more smarter followers, some of the more smarter viewers might remember that as the same month that the Ukrainians launched their Kharkiv counteroffensive, which broke through the Russian front line in the Kharkiv Oblast, leading to the Russians to being pushed out of important strategic cities like Kupyansk and making it so a, a predicted Russian encirclement of Kamatorsk could not happen and that they were uh, they completely lost their hold on the Kharkiv Oblast. So he was wrong on Odessa and he was wrong on Kharkiv. Every single time Douglas McGregor makes a prediction about the war in Ukraine, every single time Douglas McGregor says that the Ukrainians are done They've got no more fight in them. After Bakhmut, they're obliterated. After March 2022, they're obliterated. After all these other times, they're obliterated. Every single time, he has been wrong. And I have no reason to believe that we should listen to the person who is wrong 10, 15, 20 times. If somebody makes a bad prediction about a war once, it should make you start reconsidering if you should take their, their words at face value. They do it twice. Now you really need to reconsider whether you're even listening to them three times you should be halfway out the door but this is like eight nine times and this is only what i could get in like five to ten minutes of digging if i spent a half hour to an hour digging on this guy we could find piles and piles and piles of claims just like this that he has pushed out since day one of this war that has been wrong 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 but he steeps he still keeps making 
the same style of prediction and it's still getting published in dumb fuck low effort publications like the American Conservative. If you take Douglas McGregor at his word and his predictions at face value, you are a schmuck who can't think for yourself and you're listening to a con artist who are saying these hyperbolic, crazy predictions to get attention and make money. He's an attention whore and a con artist.